is once this hardware design is done, we don't change the hardware. It's all software from here on out. Right? It's, it's trivial hardware cost, just like the smartphone. You don't expect the user interface physically to change. You expect the software and services to just get better and better for your smartphones. We don't even think about it. But I mean, it was only at 10 years ago, like, is the Nokia phone or the Motorola phone or the Sony phone physically the way it laid out buttons and hardware? That's what defined each generation of phone, and it's all software now. That software goes into cars. Um, actually, that's, yeah, that's my car next to uh, the Google latest uh, you know, version that they, they had to switch from the Prius because they changed the, um, the way the OCD um, readout works on the anti-lock braking system. That's how they get the accurate read on it. In the old time, remember, they had a clamp and a big contraption on the wheel. Then Prius for a while had a version you could use. Now they have to switch to this vehicle. And of course, they're going to build their own. And they're going to put that spinning Velodyne down into the mirror, the rear, uh, each uh, rear mirror. So you have two cheap ones. And the whole cost of everything it takes to build a normal car into a, one of these kind of things would be less than $1,000 uh, cost of goods to start and then coming down dramatically over time. So the point being is um, I think these vehicles have been safer than some drivers for a while now. So three years, I've been, so I've been behind the wheel and I've been in these things several times, highway and um, suburban. And even three years ago, I promise you that vehicle is safer than my parents who are driving. <laughs> Oh my gosh, and my son can tell you, when, when Papa Tony's driving, I mean, it's just like, he's old and I'm backing up and I'm not looking because it hurts to turn my neck and he's just changing lanes and we're cringing. And every once in a while, mom hits him and says, you know, about that day, which is Estonian for watch out. And then he's all startled and it's, it's, it's just, I mean, scary. Um, and he still has his license. Uh, you know, these vehicles have sensors. They do glancing radar off the road so that I was, we were behind an 18 wheeler on Highway 101 and we could see two or three cars ahead of the 18 wheeler because of the glancing um, reflections off the road at a very low angle. So it's almost like having a God's eye view. If you were driving your own car from above, like in a video game where you could see everything, you'd be able to drive your own car better. And the computer has the advantage of sensors and data that the human driver never can have. It can integrate all mirrors, right? It's all this data is available to you. So that's why I think and I hope that my son will never need to drive. Right? We don't want to be driving machines. We don't want to be automatons. Driving for fun out at Laguna Seca, awesome. The daily commute is horrible, right? If you're in stop and go traffic, that is not fun, right? And I think the dream of the open roads and, and the liberation we all felt as teenagers when we first drove correlates with being separated from depending on your parents to get you places. So it's the ability to go to wherever you want to go as a young person that we associate so strongly with our love for automobiles and the freedom of the open road. But if you really stop and think about it, if you're in a nasty commute, there's nothing about that that makes you want to drive your own vehicle. And one day we probably won't be allowed to. Oh yeah, and by the way, I've never seen a Prius handle. That was the very first ride I took, uh, upper left corner. Wheels off the ground. I did not know a Prius is capable of that. <laughs> How far do you think we are from uh, a marketable, marketable uh, self-driving cars? And what do you think that means for companies like Tesla, whether people are actually going to buy cars at that point in time? Let me see if I understand the second half. Um, I'm not sure if I understood. I can totally understand how, in generic terms, how it could affect Tesla. But what did you mean by how people are going to buy cars? Well, I mean, at a point that the car can drive you to a place and then drive off to go somewhere else and maybe pick up someone else. Uh, uh, yes. Do you think that people still buy cars or they, you know, and, and when do you think that actually starts happening in your best prediction? Tough call. Because uh, I am usually, t like, as you saw with my statements, I would take one today. Even no, I've taken one three years ago, actually. I think they derated it. Um, because three years ago for Google, it was uh, just a uh, highway merge that was scaring them. Um, everything else was working really well, the same harness. But what, what Google, as some of you probably know, is actually going to do um, under Sergey's leadership now is ship this unusually looking car. It looks kind of like a Hello Kitty kind of little wagon. No, no, no steering wheel. Uh, maximum speed of 25 miles per hour, a foam front end. And the design spec is that it's impossible to kill someone, which is kind of an unusual, like, you know, failure is not an option approach to, to this, you know, you'd normally take a little risk. And they literally mean like someone die, you know, does the flying suicidal leap in front of the vehicle, it won't kill them, it'll just hurt them, right? Um, that limitation is, is of course, uh, plausible in an urban Uber-like deployment, right? So if these will not be owned, no customer will own these, they'll just be operating a service competing with their biggest investment, Uber. Um, uh, <laughs> And, and the timing of those two decisions were identical, which is funny. Um, but uh, 
there are a lot of technology packages. So the, the most of the automotive industry relies on Continental, Bosch, or someone else for the electronics and software. They've long since atrophied those skills, right? So you imagine back in the early days of radio, Delphi, somebody else does the radio. They've, they've gone down this path, ABS and all the electronic systems, where they've withered away their software talent, what little they have. This is why almost every EV outside of Tesla uses big, simple batteries, because the software is simpler on the management side. And the idea of thousands of cylindrical cells and all the complexities in software that need to be uh, controlled for, is a little daunting to them. Um, so when it comes to autopilot or auto driving, much of the industry will just bolt on something from a few basically suppliers in the supply chain. And uh, therefore the timing is somewhat hard to predict because it's a multi-party question. Like, you know, someone like Tesla or SpaceX can say because of vertical integration, we're gonna introduce something and do the whole thing. Whereas the, the rest of the industry in both categories relies on, well, I can't build a new rocket unless the engine manufacturer makes me a new engine, for example. I like to talk about the rocket analogies more because it's safer. Uh, uh, you know, and so you're, you're kind of stuck, right? Everyone's doing the same thing. They're all like within a few percent of each other. The, um, the, the two paths to market, um, the, the existing car companies typically take the safe path of creeping incrementalism around um, cruise control because it's something that each, you know, everyone understands a slightly better cruise control and it doesn't suddenly provoke a new regulatory regime. Because for car companies that are in the car business, their worst fear is that something changes that gives them liability for how their car performs. Right now it's like, hey, bad driver. You know, it's not my fault if the driver just did something ridiculous, right? As we think about a future that the car drives itself, wait a minute, why is it the driver's fault? Right, that future shifts, li shifts liability potentially. They don't want to go there. So what they do is they're moving down the slow and simple path. A new entrant like Google has no installed base. They don't care about effects on the existing automotive industry. So they, can, they should have and could have done bold steps. And they started doing bold steps. Now they're dialing that back. Um, I'm not sure why other than the lawyers took over. Um, uh, the, and so the other, so one is that, so that, that, that highway only solution that a lot of companies are doing. Another one you could do is um, low speed urban mm -hmm. where parking, parallel parking, sharing vehicles, um, also there's all kinds of stuff you could do on campuses and buses. I mean, I think the biggest low hanging fruit economically is long distance trucking, mm -hmm. but it's politically and marketing wise the worst area because who wants to make trucking companies more profitable? The public won't rise up and say, you know, good, let's have those robot 18 wheelers on the road. Um, <laughs> So for good reason, Google is not even considering commercial vehicles to start. Um, and so I think you'll see um, urban solutions that lead towards a rental model, because that's just, I mean, 40% of, of, of time driving in cities is looking for parking, and 40% of real estate in cities is for parking. This is, you can imagine new cities in China where neither exist, and you say there will be no drivers, you know, because you could have charter cities with a different mantra and say, how would we do urban planning differently uh, if we didn't have anyone driving? You could have vehicles, just no drivers. Um, and that's not that far off. So timing, I don't know. Uh, that urban solution, you know, the, the things you need to do it will be here in two or three years. How long does it take to percolate out? Who's gonna provide the capital? How, you know, just like with EVs and charging resources, who, who do, what, how do you get the chicken and egg problem solved, right? And like, if you're gonna get rid of parking lots, is it, again, a new city? Does it have to be, a, you know, or is there any way to incrementally change and roll out into existing cities? So it's more questions than answers. All I know is if you look at 500 years, there's no question. That's where we're ending up. And just like EVs itself, a lot of opportunities to make money exist when you have multi, multi hundred billion dollar shifts of the economy like that. Um, and we're trying to figure that out as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.